to King David Class 2. Yay! <laughs> Tonight, we are going to cover the rise and fall of King Saul. This is part two. It's kind of the Empire Strikes Back of the whole six-part series. Uh, today is pretty dark. You'll see what I mean when we get into it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Oh, Lord God, thank you that you are here with us tonight. Send us your Holy Spirit that we may hear from you, that we may understand what you want to teach us, and that we may all grow closer to you tonight. Oh, God, give me your words and give me your peace. St. David, pray for us. St. Solomon, pray for us. St. Samuel, pray for us. St. Jonathan, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Last week, you tackled 1 Samuel chapters 1 through 15. How many of you actually got a chance to read it over this past week? Quite a few of you. Awesome. How'd it go? I couldn't put it down. <laughs> you couldn't put it down, huh? It is pretty gripping. It is. Pretty brutal. It is also pretty brutal. Yeah, I figured I might get some questions about that tonight. Uh huh. What was the deal with uh, Amalek? Amalek. Oh, in the book of Exodus. Just after the Israelites have crossed through the Red Sea, after Moses is part of the Red Sea, they arrive in the wilderness, and they think they're safe from the Egyptians, and they're greeted by the Amalekites, who are out to annihilate them. That is where Moses climbs up on a hill to watch the battle and raises the staff in the air. And as long as he's got the staff raised in the air, then the Israelites are winning the battle. But as soon as he starts to put down the staff, the Amalekites begin to win the battle. So he sends down Joshua, his general. It's the first time we meet Joshua in the Bible to uh, lead the fight. And Moses stays up on the hill holding up his staff, and he gets uh, two, two people to hold up his arms on either side. But uh, that's the first time we see the Amalekites. Ever since that moment that the Israelites left Egypt, they have been not only the, I mean, militarily attacking Egypt, but also they spread their idols to Israel. And that's the problem with every single nation around Israel at this point. The Philistines, the Amalekites, all the rest of those names. Their form of idol worship was known even in the ancient world to be exceptionally brutal. Much, much later, the Greeks and the Romans would look down on the Canaanites and go, Wow, these people practice a brutal religion. They practiced not just temple prostitution, but human sacrifice of babies, human sacrifice of adults, and just every kind of perversion you can think of in the name of worshiping God. And the Israelites are catching this. It's contagious. It keeps coming into their culture over and over again. And God was, seemed really ticked off. Yeah, know? it's like, where in the world did that come from? So says, go now and attack Amalek and deal with him and all that he has under the ban. Do not spare him, but kill men and women, children, infants, mm -hmm. oxen, and sheep, camels, and food. It's brutal. And since it's brutal and everybody kind of cringes at it and goes, what in the world is going on here? I'll give more of the background story. I still don't know that I can uh, make it sound cheerful and acceptable. After a decade of struggling with this, I don't know that I fully grasped it, but I have realized a few points that I think are worth sharing. One is, God originally told the people of Israel in the book of Exodus, when you go into the promised land, I will drive out the nations before you. I'll drive them out, he says, with hornets. I forget what else. But that God was going to, through natural disasters, through natural circumstances, drive the settled people out of the promised land and Israel was going to occupy an empty kingdom. After Israel worshipped the golden calf, that didn't happen. God changed to plan B. Since you're so fond of idols, and Israel would keep being fond of idols over and over again, you will have to see what happens when you worship idols. 
worshiping idols leads to death. It leads to spiritual death. It leads to physical death. And from that point on, God puts it on the Israelites to kill the idol worshipers in the land. That idol worship must be driven out of the land. That's what's going on there. Because if they don't drive idol worship out of the land, they're going to forget about God and become idolaters themselves, which they do, which keeps happening over and over again. So the question in my mind is, I mean, I believe that God has the power to judge his people that he made. He has the power to judge us. I also believe that the Bible tells us that at this point in history, the Canaanites had reached such a point of sin and perversion that there was no good left in some of these cities. It's like Abraham when he interceded for Sodom back in the book of Genesis. God, are there not 50 people left in the city that you can save the city for their sake? No. Are there not 40, 30, 20, 10? No, there really aren't. That's the kind of situation we're talking about here. And we'll see that there are exceptions. God will save righteous people out of these Canaanites. But God has given the orders for the Canaanites, because of their continued idolatry, to be annihilated. It's brutal. It's absolutely not in keeping with anything else that comes after it. Once the Israelites stop being tempted by idolatry, after the Babylonian captivity, 587 BC, this brutal type of warfare is never seen again. And Jesus obviously completely speaks against it in the New Testament. Let the wheat and the tares grow up together. Love your neighbor. Forgive your neighbor 70 times 7. There's all kinds of passages in the New Testament that can be applied against this type of warfare. So no, it's a puzzle. It's a struggle. Another thought is that God absolutely <coughs> does accommodate himself to the customs and cultures of the day. Is God railing against polygamy in this time period? No. And yet we hear in the book of Genesis that God created man and woman for each other, not man and women for each other. And yet God allows these cultural things to go unchecked. That's probably part of the story. We're looking at Bronze Age warfare. The Israelites were absolutely not the only people doing this. Everybody was doing it. So that's actually probably a pretty likely suggestion that God was allowing this as part of their culture. Yee. Another thought worth considering. Anyway, it's an awful topic. <laughs> it's scary thinking about our culture, yes. isn't it? Yes. <laughs> it is. It's scary thinking about how many blind spots we probably have in our culture that we don't even think about, that we just live with every day. You know, it would seem to me that we're not that much different in many instances. Take abortion, for instance. That is the huge example. Yes. So, um, and, and, and it, it's, but it seems to me that God is giving us graces that those of us that realize the, it's an abomination to speak out. And I think he is giving us um, in his time or in our time of realization that he is giving us the means, you know, to, to um, educate these people. I believe that lots of people, well, of course, born into certain families where they have never been taught about the value of life yes. or respect. Mm -hmm. So this just keeps going on and on but and on. I, I picture that just maybe 3,000 years from now, people are going to look back and talk about us primitive people that sacrificed our babies. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, we're, we're talking about today that we're still looking at idolatry here. I mean, it might not be the golden calf, but it could be the golden parachute or uh, the holy dollar. Absolutely. Our idols are less obvious and every bit as present. And thank you for reminding me. That's actually a point very much worth noting about this type of Old Testament warfare. The, how, did, how did New Testament Christians, how did church fathers look at the Old Testament at this type of warfare? They grappled with it too. They looked back at it and went, this isn't the God we know and love. What in the world is going on here? 
And what they did is they took it allegorically. They didn't bother trying to tease it out literally, at least not very often. They went idolatry and the peoples that worship idols in the Old Testament, they're, out, they're, they're a type of sin in our life. They stand for sin. And just like we are, and, and just like Israel was supposed to root these people out of the land, we are supposed to root sin out of our life entirely. We're not supposed to leave just a little bit of it lying around because it's going to come back. That is the helpful way of reading these passages because they're going to come up over and over again in the Old Testament. It's also the helpful way of reading some of the angry psalms, you know, where where uh, the psalmist asks for vengeance on my enemies. Who's our enemy? Our enemy is the devil. And we want God to crush him, not crush our human enemies who are struggling like we are, but to keep our eyes on who our real enemy is, sin, death, and the devil. So the allegorical way of reading these Old Testament passages is helpful and extremely long-established.